Good morning, Harvest. Good morning, or whenever you're watching this. Um, I've got three quotes right away. I want to quote some people. Three Frenchmen, one American. First one, we promise according to our hopes, and we perform according to our fears, which means, you know, when times are good, we make promises, but when fear comes, it can move us a certain direction. The second quote, the best way to keep one's word is not to give it. That was Napoleon, so you got to, that's probably why he said that. Third quote, it is useless to hold a person to anything he says while he is in love, drunk, or running for office. See, we make promises when emotions are high, feelings are strong, but fear has a way of eroding those promises. People make promises even to us that they fail to keep. Spouses who leave, dollars never paid back, jobs that never materialize. So it makes us fearful to trust anyone except ourselves, but that will put a strain upon us. Can we really guarantee our own promises? In uncertain times, we need things that we can count on. We need firm footing, which reminds me of uh, growing up. My dad is a fisherman. He was a fisherman and would take me on these outings as early as we could. As, as soon as the snow was, was gone, we would go up these mountain roads to these remote places to find these fish. And it must have been an exceptionally wet winter and spring because the road, the dirt roads were eroded in several places and the creeks were surging with water. In one place, a lot of the road was gone and the water was flowing almost like at 12 inches deep. And my dad, he was ready to go right through it in his little love pickups, Chevrolet love pickups. Some of you remember those mini trucks and I didn't trust it. I made my dad pull over and I got out and I stood on firm footing, terra firma. I didn't want to go across. It was, uh, I didn't think the road could handle the truck nor the truck handle the mini river that was flowing across it. When we talk about promises, God's promises are firm. They're sure. His word is true. We can stand upon those promises. Promises, standing on the promises. You remember that song? I grew up singing that song in our church, Standing on the Promises. It went something like this. One of the verses, Standing on the promises that cannot fail When the howling storms of doubt and fear assail By the living word of God I shall prevail Standing on the promises of God. And then the chorus, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing, standing. And the worship leader would hold you right there, especially when we were rousing with praise. I'm standing on the promises of God. We need to hear those promises today. So I've got a promise that I want to preach on. It's one of my favorite. In fact, my wife can attest that it's in most of my prayers, or lots of my prayers. It's this promise, I will never leave you nor forsake you. It's the promise of his presence. With you always. With you always. It's fact, in fact, it's first spoken in Deuteronomy 31, verse 8. Let me read it for us. In fact, I'll start with verse 7 to get some context. Then Moses summoned Joshua and said to him in the sight of Israel, Be strong and courageous, for you shall go with this people into the land that the Lord has sworn to their fathers to give them, and you shall put them in possession of it. Now our verse. It is the Lord who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. It's, um, it means that God is out front, ever-present, 
never leaving, always with you. Let's talk about out front, that he would go be for you. Let me, and let me be clear, even as we're going to Deuteronomy 31, we are not Israel, and God is not promising us that we get possession of some kind of land. This verse cannot be taken to mean that when you're looking for farmland out in Illinois, that you can pray and God would drive out the former owners and you would, get, uh, you would be given the land free. Okay? You, can't, you can't take promises like that. God is fulfilling a covenant he made with Abraham. Therefore, not every promise to Israel is a promise to us. But the promise of his presence, that's a promise for us. And that is throughout the entire scriptures. I think of 1 Chronicles 28, verse 20. Here is David at the end of his life telling his son Solomon, who's going to take the throne after him, be strong and courageous. He will be with you. He will go before you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. And when Jesus was at the end of his life and he spoke to, the, spoke to his disciples, in Matthew 28, verse 20, said, Behold, I will be with you, even to the end of the age. And then the presence of the Holy Spirit of God is the fulfillment of that promise until Christ's return, that he will be with you, out front, ever-present, never failing. Now back to uh, Deuteronomy 31. This is a scary moment for them. They're on the border of the promised land after 40 years in the wilderness. Now, why are they in the wilderness? Well, <laughs> because their parents stood at the same place and refused to go into the promised land and trust the Lord. They thought that they would be slain by a sword. They thought that their children would be put to death by a sword. And now here their children are, same place. They face the same challenge. Are they going to enter the promised land and obey or stay in the wilderness? It's the whole business of change. Change. When change comes to our life, do we welcome it? Can we trust the Lord when everything changes? When Moses was taking and leading the people of Israel out of Egypt, they went reluctantly. Now, why, why would that be? They were slaves, weren't they? Yes. But as awful as that experience was, there was a comfort in the routines, in the routines of slavery, in the routines in Egypt. Crazy. I mean, to get out of Egypt and move into the wilderness and live in makeshift tents, no thank you. But now the wilderness has become a home for their children. And change is happening again. The predictable life routines were going to change. Now Moses is 120 years old. He's not going into the promised land. He's giving the leadership to another man, Joshua. Everything's changing. And they still have to go into the land that's foreign to them with giants in it. And verse 8, when it says that the Lord will go before you out in front, well, it means that the Lord is going to meet the enemies. He's going to fight our battles. When I was young, um, if there was like a, a scary room that I didn't want to go into, it was dark or especially down in the basement, I would get my mom and dad and have them go first. They were out in front of me so that if some hideous creature came up and attacked us, I would be shielded. It's the same idea. God goes before us. It means that he fights our battles. He takes down the strength of the enemy. Even imaginary enemies that cause us to retreat. Because life is changing for us. You're finding out right now what you put your trust in. Do you put it in your routines of life? Or do you put your trust in the Lord who is always with you out front fighting your battles? That doesn't mean that you won't experience calamity. 
that you won't experience diabetes like I have or cancer like my daughter has or that you wouldn't get the coronavirus or you won't lose a job. That may happen. But one thing that will never change and that the Lord is going before you. We have nothing to fear. We can be strong and courageous because he is with us always out in front and now ever present. Ever present. He will be with you. So nighttime was probably the most difficult for me growing up. I was deathly afraid. And I needed, when I was laying on my bed, to hear someone cough, rustle, uh, any noise from people that I knew. I didn't want to be the only one awake. And if fear overtook me, last resort, I took it often, I would go downstairs. My uh, room was upstairs. I'd go downstairs, knock on my parents' uh, bedroom door, and mom would come up, and she would lie with me until I fell asleep. Her presence gave me comfort, ever present. Moses ran from Egypt long before he was a deliverer. You know that he ran away from Egypt. He went into the land of Midian. He got married. He had kids. He settled down. He became a shepherd. It was the quiet life for him. Until that quiet life was interrupted by God speaking to him through this burning bush. And in Exodus chapter 3, he's asking Moses to go back to Egypt and deliver his people. And Moses rightly said, who am I that I should tell the Pharaoh to let the people go? And the Lord responded in Exodus 3, 12, I will be with you. I will be with you. And when the people were delivered then from Egypt and traveling through the wilderness, they knew that the Lord was with them by a visible cloud by day and a fire by night. Even David, one of the greatest kings in Israel, he had to be reminded of this promise in Psalm 23, verse 4. You remember it. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. The word evil could be calamity, uh, even coronavirus. I will fear no evil. Why? For you are, help me, with me, with me. And God told Israel through Isaiah the prophet in chapter 41, verse 10, Fear not, for I am with you. What God was asking Israel to do, to take possession of the promised land, seemed frightening. I mean, what do they know of war? Not only are they leaving their homes, the routines of their life in the wilderness, they would be fighting people that their parents called giants. Let me ask you this. Are you afraid today? Just a little bit? Everything's changing. And life may look different after all of this is over and we're able to resume. But one thing will never change. Our God is ever-present. He is with you always. You don't know what the future holds. You might lose your job only to find a better one. God can do that. But you may have to downsize. You may get the virus. But one thing that never changes, he's with you always. The best thing, better than anything else, is God being present. That's why God later sent his only son. And when he arrived, he was called in Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, Emmanuel, which means God with us. It's awesome. We're all in this together. One day, you know, we're all going to speak of this, much like we speak of 9-11, experiencing 9-11. And what will you remember about your God? What, what have you learned? And what will you have learned from this experience? 
I pray that you will speak of his ever-present help in time of need, that he is with you always, out front, ever-present, never leaving. Never leaving. Don't you love that promise? I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I think that's why I called for my mom and not my dad when I was afraid at night. My dad would come up and wouldn't stay long enough. He'd go back to bed. But my mom, she was merciful, self-sacrificing. She would stay there until I reached the other side into deep sleep. Israel has a, a new life promised on the other side, in the promised land. But it's going to require strength and courage. All these are byproducts of faith. Which means they will need to stand on the promises of God. They will need to hear a promise and act on that promise. Hear a promise, act on that promise. They'll rehearse a promise, like, I'll always be with you, I'll never leave you nor forsake you, and then move in obedience. That's what it means. God made a covenant with Israel that he would never leave, and it's a promise that he kept, even though Israel turned to other gods later. God removed them from the promised land, and, but his presence went with them to Babylon and then back again with the decree of Cyrus the king. He is faithful to his promises, even though we're not. And with the coming of Jesus, God the Father enacted the new covenant, which is a promise, a new covenant purchased with his son's blood on the cross. Now, why would he do that? Because he knew that we would not be faithful to our promise of obedience. So Jesus secured the relationship with the Father by taking our punishment, taking the punishment for sins that we would commit. And then by faith in Jesus, we're secure. We're brought into this relationship, a relationship that God is out front, he's ever present and never, ever leaving, never failing. And the guarantee of that promise is the presence of the Holy Spirit re residing in every believer. That's why the Holy Spirit is called the Comforter. Christian, the Holy Spirit of God is with you. No, 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 even in you. Even in you. That's awesome. Strong and courageous we can be. No longer fearful, no longer dismayed. Listen, listen to Romans chapter 8, verse 35. Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword or we could insert coronavirus. You know why he's asking these things? It's because during persecution and famine, the first thing that you think of is, God, where are you? Have you left me? And the answer is no. These things don't separate us from the love of Christ. And he goes on to the end of chapter 8. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Do you have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, his son? Because if you do, he will go before you, out front, will be ever present. He'll never leave you, ever, ever leave you. Call out to him. Call out to him. Pray to God through Jesus Christ. Believe in your heart that Jesus died on the cross to forgive your sin and rose from the dead to prove that he is the Son of God and could die on our behalf. He rose 
and he ascended to the right hand of God the Father. Believe it, and you will be saved. Believe it, and you will be saved. My question for you is this. What more needs to happen in your life for you to move toward God in a relationship through Jesus Christ? What else has to happen? What else has to happen? And I just beg you, have a relationship with Jesus. Christian, God's asking you to trust him even when all the old routines are being swept away. He wants to do something new in you, which means you have to take the grip off of your old patterns. But you can, you can trust him. He is faithful. He goes before you. He's out front. He's ever-present. He never leaves you. He's faithful. You have nothing to fear for he will be with you always. I think of a, another song I used to sing in my church. It, it goes something like this. Maybe you sang it too. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus Just to take him at his word Just to rest upon his promise just to know, thus saith the Lord, Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I've proved him o'er and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Here's another verse. I'm so glad I learned to trust him. Precious Jesus, save your friend. And I know that you are with me. Will be with me to the end. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him. How I have proved him o'er and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. May God give you the grace to trust him more. God bless you. You are loved, Harvest.